back to another episode of Celebrating Art. I'm your host, Monty Taylor, and today we have an extraordinary show where we'll have two artistic perceptions exchanging their viewpoints of the art of living. Today, our co-host, David Jardina, will be interviewing Robert Levithan, kind of a Renaissance man, acclaimed for his writing, his counseling, his performing. Uh, Dave, as you know, David Jardina, our co-host, is very well known on the New York and national scene as a crooner filmmaker and the two of them together are going to be showing us how the real art is the art of living the art of life we're going to learn today that change is not loss change can be evolution when you take a step upward when you see a new experience and integrate it in a creative way into your consciousness we're going to talk about the art of the human psyche we're going to delve into the Jungian perspectives of counseling and bringing out the hidden magnificence in all of us. Autumn in New York Why does it seem so inviting? You're a Renaissance man. I, I think that's the good word for you, Renaissance well, man. Well, on a good day, I'm a Renaissance man. On a bad day, I'm a dilettante. Okay. On how wow. you look at it. All right. Well, we'll stick with the Renaissance okay. part today. All right. So that's what you've been called, actually. And um, you've been an uh, author, and your book has been very, very favorably reviewed. So let's talk about uh, how you came to this journey, this kind of very varied but very focused creative journey. I always have felt in a sense, the draw towards creativity. I, the reason I guess the, the term Renaissance man is used for me is that my life is my work of art more than any specific one thing that I've done. Mm -hmm. I'm always interested in what's the next thing to do, the next things to do that are of interest to me that, that make me feel engaged and creative. And that has changed over the years. So I started out as a performer. I did, I've done lots of things that I wasn't trained to do. I never took a dance class, and then I danced for Twyla Tharp for a year. Did you? No, um, I didn't know that either. Yeah, I danced in the, I was in the movie Hair, actually. So wow. you see, I'm, I, so I've done all these odd things that weren't supposed to happen, which were just so much fun. I've had peak creative experiences in many fields, mm -hmm. and then I would move on. And the thing that settled me down, actually, is when I went back to graduate school in my late, late 30s, and... Um, became a psychotherapist when I was graduating they asked me to please be a psychotherapist they said you know you tend to move on from things so you might consider graduate school enough of an experience and never actually practice and I realized that I had always done two or three things at a time so for about 10 years I was only a psychotherapist and that helped me to have a deeper experience but that 10 years was up a few years ago so then I started writing a column for Oprah's the Design Shrink writing about psychology and design based on my doing interiors and um, for people and then I was morphing into the latest writing project uh, was the new 60 well actually the penultimate one and that came about when I realized that I was almost 59 years old because I've been HIV positive since 1984. I see. Well, I tested positive in 84 as part of a study, probably much longer. And so the idea of, of my 60s and on had wasn't, hadn't been part of my picture for many years. So I decided to look at my life and living through the lens of aging from a perspective of privilege and gratitude. To me, getting older is a privilege. I agree. And a lot of people see it as a loss. Mm -hmm. And so I <laughs> decided to write a column about that. So I wrote for 18 months, and that has been collected and edited, and it's now the book, The New 60. Uh, I had thought I'd written a book primarily about survival and hope and tools for resilience and how to keep your life and be engaged and creative in your life. And um, I found out that a lot of people thought I'd written a book about sex. Hmm. So it's you know, the perspective of the reader. And so, the f talking about sex in the, our culture, to write honestly about one's sex life is unusual. I want to just talk, that's a, a, yeah. it's in our culture. And that's how we actually met through a project around this. Absolutely, this, yes. 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 So we'll, I definitely want to talk about that in your acting. Yes. But in our culture, we continue to have this disconnect between life and sex. You know, other things, you know, sex is always by itself. And I think that's been taught to us from different places, religion, certainly. Don't talk about it. Don't talk about it. Yeah. Don't show so it. Yeah. Well, don't admit that you do it. It's all right that you do these things, but why are you talking about them? And for yeah. me, if you don't talk about it, it implies shame. Right. And right. I'm, I, I'd like to consider myself a shame buster. Good. That's, my, that's my primary goal at this point yeah. in my life, is I, I want to help 
rid our culture of shame, particularly around sex, yeah. around sexuality, around our ages and internalized um, prejudice. Mm. And that's another area that I write about a lot and I do workshops yes. on. Now, ageism is the most uh, universal one. Mm. Almost, there's very few people, if you're over the age of 25, certainly over the age of 30, almost everyone wants to be perceived as younger. Interesting. So when we're passing, that's a sign of internalized prejudice for no reason. If I think it's better to be younger, I'm saying that what I am is not all right. It's, it reminds me of the compliment. People say, you know, they'll ask your age. Wow, you look great for your age. Yes, exactly. I, I don't consider that a compliment necessarily. Mm -hmm. I understand they're trying to be uh, complimentary. Yes. But I don't think that But there's the implied idea. Yeah. And so when someone says to me, you don't look 60, I paraphrase Gloria Steinem, which is, no, this is what 60 looks like. Yes, exactly. Because it's important to create that new image, the, the new 60. That's where the title comes from. The idea that 60 can be something else, 70 can be something else, 50, 80, whatever our age is. I just want to mention, take a time to mention Bobby's book. It's called The New 60, and it's all about Bobby's experience being in, in the aging process mm -hmm. and embracing the aging process as a privilege rather than as something to be ashamed of or a loss or too bad you're so old kind of thing. So this book is just a combination of your uh, articles about this it's topic. It's the articles and it's partially memoir, partially professional perspective. So my clients, my work informs it and my this crazy life I've had. Yeah, yes, yeah. this crazy wonderful life. And I would say a lot of creative people, no matter what their field, paint Painting, photography, if they're really focused, I think that they're trying to express a lot of the things you're doing. They're trying, their goal is to bust myths and to kind of shatter the norm and break out and really get to the core of what's true and bring that out. Uh, people like Mapplethorpe, mm -hmm. um, which, uh, who you've worked with. Yes, he photographed me in 1979, and yes. I had a wonderful experience with Robert. I mean, I found him to be a, a total gentleman. and. Uh, very elegant in his you know, intercourse with me around the work and, yeah. and, and sitting for him. Yeah. I wish I could have met him. He seems like a really cool soul. The person who really opened my eyes and literally taught me that I had an eye for photography was Peter Hujar, who was a great photographer, covered some of the same territory as Robert. They were, had been compared to Mozart and Salieri, and Hujar was Mozart, the great artist, but he also was self-sabotaging. So in his lifetime, he did not have great success, but posthumously, he's, you know, there's shows all still going on all Up over the world in museums. So I had the, the uh, interesting experience of walking into MoMA and seeing a photograph of me on the wall in the midst of a sexual act. You know, things like that have happened because of, because <laughs> um, we, you know, when I, I lived that. with Peter, was, I, we lived with the camera. Mm. So the camera was involved in um, yeah. everything in our lives yeah. for that, those couple of years we were together. Yeah. So one of my favorite roles that I've been is a muse. Mm because I consider that a very creative role, to be the muse and participate with an artist in mm -hmm. the creation of their work. I see. How did you meet Mapplethorpe and these people? Well, actually, I, I met Hujar through my work with Robert Wilson, the theater director. I worked with Bob on and off for about eight years. And um, it was a downtown avant-garde art scene in the 70s, so everyone mm -hmm. knew everyone. Yeah. And I met Hujar, and then after he had photographed me, his friend Lynn Davis, who's still alive and working, fantastic photographer, she had also photographed me. Robert and Lynn did a show called Trade-Offs, I think it was about 1979, that was at ICP, where they each photographed the same people. So each of them chose some pe photographs they had done, and the other person had to photograph who they had photographed. So Lynn chose photographs of me, so Robert had to photograph That That you know, opened the door for for me to be uh, photographed by Mapplethorpe. And then over the years, you know, once it's like anything in show business and the arts, once you've been, you're known to be the muse of one artist or the subject Word of one artist, everyone wants of course, to be right. are interested yes. because yeah. they want to know, well, who is that person? Yeah. Yes. So, you know, it, it leads to opening doors along yeah. the way. Yeah, so you don't need an agent. Uh, no. Yeah, I know. <laughs> That's good. Very, very good. Yeah. Now, we were talking about sex, and I, and I just, yeah. not to lose the thread for a moment, because... You know, the new 60 led to what I'm doing now. The Out Hotels, the first gay boutique hotel in New York City, and they're planning on making this. This is a prototype for a chain. And where is the hotel? It's on West 42nd Street. Okay. And it's in, a, it's in a New York great City. Space. Uh -huh. yeah, fantastic space. They brought me in as a cultural consultant. Patrick Duffy, the creative director, who I've known for years, said, you know, would you come work with us on this project? Because we want 
to have a cultural component. And then they said, would you be willing to write a sex advice column? And I said, sure, it sounds like fun. So I'm now doing a weekly Q&A sex advice column. And um, they, they suggested a title which I didn't love. And so I proposed a title which we're using, which is The Ethical Slut. Yeah. Which I have appropriated. I have to give credit to... That um, book. The famous yeah, book. The famous book on that, which yeah. is about polyamory. Right. And my, I'm not taking it from the position of polyamory necessarily, but I love the idea of appropriating a term which has traditionally been negative and turning it into a positive. Right. So the way people have done that with queer, you know, people of color have done that with the, the N-word, which I, right. well, I can't appropriate. We, yes. Um, Various things, and so I feel like the word slut. I want slut to become Me too. a positive I word. I like the word slut. Yes. I really do. So, But I also like you know, juxtaposition, so ethical slut. Mm. Two things that you don't usually see together. Right. And I think ethics is at the core of my life. I believe in integrity. Breaking shame includes you know, living in integrity. Yeah. Wholeness. That's great. The polyamorous community opened the door to the idea that it's about communication. Honesty, working right. things out, yes. commitment, not necessarily monogamy. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I'm always looking for popular art to express this. So it's great when someone like you comes along because you're doing that. But when you go to a movie, you still have the same old, tired notions about relationships. You know, one person falls in love, another person, they're supposed to stay together, and if they don't, they failed. And they have to end up together by the end of the film, otherwise, we're sad for them. And they, or something is wrong. Well, I hope picture. I'm. I know you well enough to know you. I'm sure you're writing things that will that are have different different contexts. Yeah, I'm trying and, to. And that's one of the reasons for people to tell their story because yeah. people's stories don't match the myth of you know the Hollywood myth, right? The romantic exactly. fairy tale myth. They never, they never Our did. stories are more complex. Yeah. I mean, some of my best relationships in my life today are people who were lovers at one time. Yeah. So I believe in the concept of when you have business with someone, that business can go on and the form can change. Right, exactly. And I don't consider it a failure when a relationship shifts. Yeah. You know, I have better relationships with some of my exes now than I did when we were together. Yeah. yeah. And that can't happen. It doesn't always happen. But, Not always. But no. I think you're, the, the key word is honesty. Most people consider what, uh, you know, uh, infidelity. They consider that a sex crime. Mm. But it isn't. It's a crime of, of dishonesty. Yes. So it's really, if you are always speaking your truth as fast as you can and communicating and being respectful, there is no betrayal. Yeah. There can be pain, but there isn't betrayal. betrayal. And yeah. without, therefore, you can move forward and trust. Trust is really the key. Right. And this came up uh, the for the ethical slut. I do a monthly salon at the Out Hotel. First Which Monday I have of every to get month. to. I've heard good things and, about these um, salons. And you know, it's wonderful because I well, I'll have a guest and we'll we'll have a discussion. Perhaps you could be oh, my I'd guest. I'd love to be a guest. All right, oh, please. Yes. Okay. <laughs> and. Um, so then we opened up the Q and A, and what the people who show up. It's so interesting because you know the discussion in the room is just so fascinating. Mm. And that happened the other day. We were talking about the difference between monogamy and open relationships. My guest was Mark Matusik, who is a dear friend. I've uh, known him for thirty years. We were lovers back in the eighties. We've been through a lot, of, and we don't agree on a lot of things about relationships. Mm -hmm. He's a monogamist. I have not traditionally been a monogamist, and we have a lot of different points of view. But we. I respect each other's points of view very much. Which is important. And one of the women in the audience said, brought up the word trust. She said, you haven't used it. And I was, uh, I was like, wow, we haven't talked about trust. It's the core of everything. Mm. It's good to step back and question. And I think art can do that to help us to get a different perspective and question why do we believe and embrace certain things we've been told just because everyone says we have to. We, you know, one of the, it reminds me of one of the basic concepts that I believe is that shame and guilt are not innate. They're taught to us. You're right. You know, we come with feelings. We yeah. come with love, joy, sadness, anger, fear, mm. passion. You know, we, those things are part of us. However, we have to be taught what we're ashamed of or what we feel guilty about. And so much of that is around sex and, and the body. You know, you look at a baby, they have no shame. Exactly. They love their, 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 their nakedness. Yes, they love everything their pee, about them. their poop. They yeah. have no problems. They, they have to, giggle, be, they have they to be taught. Yeah. And you can see there are cultures where people walk around without their clothes on. Right. No one has a problem. Yeah. And other cultures, it's, oh my God. Yeah. So it's interesting, again, shame, you know, back to that, yeah. that, you know, to look at what if we, what if we, you know, put down our shame for a moment, what we were taught. And, and examine, you know, who am I, and what, you know, celebrate my humanity. Imagine and part of our humanity is our body. Right. Uh, imagine celebrating who we are rather than trying to suppress it or run away from it or mm -hmm. condemn it, and ourselves and others. Yeah, it's yeah. 
That's something. Well, that's what art does. I think good art. Good art. Well, good art at least has us thinking. You know, yeah. feeling and thinking. Feeling something and then perhaps being able to translate it into an, a, an openness of thought. Yeah. And uh, Let's talk about your acting a little bit along these lines. Uh, well, I haven't acted much in years. In fact, yeah. the only time I've acted in recent years is when you asked me to do a reading of yes. one of your and scripts. And you were great. Now, I, I noticed, because I'd known that you were a psychotherapist and everything mm -hmm. at the time, that uh, you really did bring that knowledge, that kind of uh, viewpoint to this, this role. Basically, um, I, it was a screenplay I had written about this resort, and there's a lot of sex going on. But there's beyond the sex, it's about uh, how people connect in many different ways, including non-sexually and uh, different emotionally ways emotionally. And uh, Robert had a lead in it. And I noticed that you there's a scene where you're talking to somebody who's been very damaged to the mm -hmm. point where they can't talk. They've lost their ability to talk. And so that's what impressed me when we were initially in the, the early stages of the reading, the rehearsals, you, had a, a, you brought an understanding in how you dealt with this character you were talking to who couldn't articulate based on some trauma. Well, I've worked with a lot of people who've been, yeah. you know, been through trauma, so I'm, it, it's a language I guess I speak. You know, I, I love that, that image that is a metaphor, you know, we, speak, we learn certain languages. Hmm. I work a lot with people who are in trauma, I work a lot with people who are in grief, and I often say grief is a language we often don't speak until we've had the experience of grief. Hmm. And when we're going through grief, when we're going through trauma, it helps to be around people who speak the language. And so, you know, to be able to have the opportunity to play a character where I can bring this experience was, yeah. is always fulfilling. Yeah, yes. And I studied, I, you know, I haven't acted many years, but I studied acting with Stella Adler, one of the great teachers. I wanted to ask you about Stella. Uh, Stella was amazing. When I studied <laughs> with Stella, she was on the cusp of 80, and she had, you know, lots of makeup, and she always wore these jumpsuits with zippers, and the zippers were always coming down, 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 down. down. <laughs> And Stella had an office, and the main thing in her office was her makeup table. So Stella spent a lot of time in the mirror. Mm. She was a faded beauty who was having a hard time with it. But in this, another sense, I remember once in the class she got angry. She got angry. And she said, got angry at the whole class, and she said, I'm still a beautiful woman, and I don't have to put up with this, and I could be somewhere else right now. And I remember one of the girls mm. in the class was about 20-something years old went, You are... You know, she at that moment she saw her beauty and her power. Yeah. So again, it's about the issue of aging. You know, yeah. that, that this was a woman. And this was twenty something years ago, thirty yeah. years ago. So an eighty-year-old thirty years ago was really to be taken as a sexual in their prime being right. was a rare thing. Yeah. Yeah. It's amazing. I look back at old films that I saw as a kid, and when I saw certain people, I I, I thought they were old. They were old and, and whatever. Yes. And now I look back and I can still see how I saw that they were old, but they are beautiful. Oh, they're, yeah. they're gorgeous. They're luminous. And not because they were being presented in a, a sexual or a romantic kind of mm -hmm. beautiful way, but they, I could see their beauty just for who they are. Yes. Coming, the way they talked, the, their, their attitude. Well, also our perspective as we age. I remember I saw The Graduate the first time when I was about 15, and mm. I thought, why would you want to sleep with that old woman? And Bancroft. Um, and Bancroft. Yeah, yeah. And then, of course, I saw it many times over the years, and I remember when I was about 40 going, God, she's, she's gorgeous. Hot. She's beautiful. She's gorgeous. And then I was having dinner with Mike Nichols, the director, and I mentioned that, and he said, yes, Annie was 37, he said, when we shot that. Hardly and older she, than and Yes, and, <laughs> and she thought that, exactly, he was 30, I think she was 37, yeah. and he said she thought she looked old the way we made her you know, look up, look. But of course she was supposed to be 37. Right. She was supposed to have gotten knocked up in the back seat of the, the car when she was, you know, in yeah. her late teens and had this daughter who's now 18. Yeah. So she was supposed to be around that, that age. age. Yeah. yeah. But they they had to age her a little bit, but still Anne mm. Bancroft she was perennially beautiful and absolutely and, and, and elegant, elegant and yes. you know it's like beauty. I like lines, you know, I like the Giorgio O'Keefe look. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I you know, I can't say for sure about anything, but I my plan is not to ever do any plastic surgery. Well, one of my secret weapons for aging is anti-gravity yoga. Uh, the wonderful Christopher Harrison, who's one of the, the great you know, loves of my life, um, created a aerial yoga technique. It's a fusion technique. It's yoga, it's Pilates, it's dance, it's acrobatics. And um, he has a, a performance company, Anti-Gravity, that's performed all over the world. You know, everything from the, the Grammys to the Oscars to... And, uh, first inauguration of Obama, 
coming up on uh, you know, television next month on Smash, all sorts of things. And um, he took this concept and brought it down to, these often are 40 feet in the air with people circling in them. And so he brought them down low and created a technique for health, well-being, and one of the most important things is inversions. You can t do a simple inversion where you turn yourself upside down and gravity works in your favor now. And it takes all the stress out of your body and it just feels fantastic. And that's one of the things that I use to keep myself in shape. So it's always about who we are. A man in one of my groups a couple of years ago said something which I, it's so simple, it's so obvious. He said, you know, no matter what you look at, like how old you are, what shape your body's in, if you walk down the street, realize that there's, there's, there are people for whom you rock their boat. Yeah. You are what they're looking for. Yeah. You know, it's like yeah. give up that idea of who you're supposed to be and really yeah. be who Isn't you that, are. That's transformative. Yeah. You know, yeah. thankful uh, it's, it's been years now, but my whole life I've been a string bean. You know, people would call me string bean literally. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, bean pole whatever. And as a kid, you know, I I thought, "Well, that's not good. Something's wrong." But then, you know, by the time I got well into my teens, I realized, "You know what? This feels good." Yeah. This you know, is good. So, I like this. Right. And, I, and then also when we own it. Yeah. It, it becomes more attractive. People yeah. respond to us based on how we hold ourselves. Yeah. You know, again, I work with people around you know their internalized issues. I work a lot with, with newly diagnosed people who have HIV, cancer, other conditions. Yeah. And very often they see themselves as taken out of the, the realm of sexuality or sexual appeal. And it's very clear to me from my work with so many people that how we present it is affects is the biggest effect on how people respond to it. Yeah, if I exactly. meet someone and yeah, basically say I'm a catch, you should want to date me. Oh, and by the way, I have HIV. They they so they'll, they'll probably adjust to it. If I say you don't want to, I'm right. damaged goods. Or I can't tell you about myself. Yeah, guys. no, they'll they'll be convinced immediately. You're right. It's very unattractive right. to tell someone that you're damaged. Yeah. My colleague Sally Fisher came up with a wonderful. Uh, tagline based on one of my old boyfriends she said um men come with warning labels <laughs> and you know it's like they're like cigarette packs and so it applies to women too of course and so are you willing to read them and apply them right people will tell you what you need to know very quickly you're right yeah yes yeah so it's it's good to, uh, you know on a blind date to at least talk on the phone uh yes <laughs> <laughs> yeah. because uh, you know when you're the texting doesn't always do it hearing yes. the voice and how they phrase things is mm -hmm. very important so well, what's next for you? What are you uh, working on? Any projects? I know you're going to continue to do well, the salon. Well, the ethical slut, I'm working on that. I'd like to you know, turn it. I see it as a live, the salon is a live format talk show, so hopefully it'll get to the web and cable. I've just started working on a children's book called Sophie's Story, which mm. is based on the story of my dog, Sophie, Beautiful who, dog, who yeah. was a seeing eye dog. And so I hope it will teach children about the training with seeing eye dogs, but also it has a moral, you know, a life lesson in that she actually flunked out. Well, she didn't flunk out. She made it to, uh, she was decommissioned is the appropriate oh. term uh, when she was three for being too social, mm. and, um, which happens to a lot of them. And so she, was, she left the field and ended up with me. And what I'd like to show is that you can set out to have a dream and then end up in something, you know, not make it in that and have even a better life. Mm. Sophie has an amazing life. She works with about 100 clients a week in my private practice and at Friends in Need, the crisis center where I work part-time. And she's traveling and flew together recently, and she flies in the cabin with me as a service dog. She has a great life. In fact, several people have said to me, my next life, I want to come back as Robert Loverfan's dog. Yeah, me too. <laughs> yeah, she's a beautiful dog. Yeah, so, yeah. so lovely. A beautiful soul. Yeah. So that's one of the projects, and I'm waiting to see what's going to show up. Yeah. yeah. Well, it looks like things are showing up. I mean, we uh, showed up. Yes, things keep happening. <laughs> yeah, I'm, yes. I, I'm happy to promote all the things you're doing. You're doing a lot of great work, and uh, basically you're bringing your practice to a wider audience now. Well, that's what I realized is that I've been... I've been a boutique um, therapist, a boutique artist in a mm -hmm. sense, and I'm interested in expanding my audience at this point. Okay. So we're talking with Bobby Levithan. I call him Bobby because we're pals. My good friend, the Renaissance man. And again, he's written this wonderful book, and I encourage everyone to read it, about aging. And actually, you know what? Aging is just another word for changing, isn't changing, it? Changing, about 
moving forward in your life, yeah. embracing the next, you know, where am I going? It's about resilience yeah. and reinvention. Yes. And it's available on Amazon, Kindle, all those lovely things, of course. And I, since this is my copy, Bobby, would you sign my book for me? Oh, with pleasure. Yes. Oh, thank you very much. Yeah. See, I call him Dave. Yeah, you can call me Dave. <laughs> Only my grandmother can call me Davey and get away with it. Okay. Oh, that's great. I appreciate this. And I'm signing this Luck and Love, which is the sign-off that my father used. And my, my father would be 101 years old if he were alive. He died a few years ago. Mm -hmm. And my brothers and I, my nieces, my nephews, we all use his sign-off, which was Luck and Love. That's mm -hmm. become, And I think that's a great thing yeah. in life. I, you know, I wish you luck and love. Yeah. It's and, a sweet thing. You know, and I'm with that. A great process as you move forward. Yeah, thank you. Thanks All so right. much.